social media very much imposes on our life. But when it comes into our inbox, we get to make those choices. Is now a good time to read that message? Do I want to snooze it for later? That is Tobin Slavin. Tobin helps entrepreneurs build email lists, conduct conversations at scale, and grow their business. He's the host of a podcast that I've been enjoying, which is called Stop Marketing Now, Do This Instead. And of course, you have to listen to the podcast to find out what you should do instead. Tobin emphasizes the importance of engaging in a conversation with potential customers and building a relationship over time. In explaining to me his approach to building remarkable, successful email lists, Tobin recalls his own sleepless nights, worrying about where his next client would come from and what he could do to move beyond word of mouth. In this show, we cover the nuts and bolts of which email platforms to use and how often emails should be sent, as well as techniques to use email as a continuing conversation from which business can grow. To learn more about Tobin and to find plenty of useful tips, visit tobinslavin.com. And that's T-O-B-I-N-S-L-A-V-E-N.com. And the link's in the show notes. And you also might want to sign up for Tobin's newsletter. And while we are on the topic of email lists, you could consider signing up for the weekly Unleashed email. I will send you a transcript of each episode, book recommendations, and consulting tips. And if you can sign up by visiting umbrex.com and click on the Unleashed tab. Hello, Tobin. Welcome to the show. Well, thanks. Thanks, Will. I appreciate you having me on. All right. So very excited. Yeah. So first, I'll say thanks for reaching out on LinkedIn. So you reached out to me, and um, as I, you know, you're, 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 as I'm sure you're you're dreadfully aware. There's like, you know, people get kind of probably a half a dozen, a dozen people reaching out every day, like offering marketing advice, or I can do Legion for your business. And I always, you know, like don't accept those, but yours kind of stood out. I mean, you're sort of in that kind of space, I guess, but stood out, had a different approach, um, much different message. And then I checked your website. I was like, wow, this is really good stuff. And I checked your podcast and I said, wow. Stop marketing now. Do this instead. And I've been listening to, I've listened to over a dozen episodes of your podcast. Really love it. And I said, oh, wow, this, this guy's awesome. So I'm really delighted to connect with you and psyched to have you on the show. Um, and, uh, you know, what I was thinking is we could kind of give us a masterclass for our listeners of, I mean, you do much more than this, but in, on this episode, maybe give us a masterclass on how, for, as an independent professional, should we think about building an email list who should we be sending stuff to? What kind of content should we send? How often? And and maybe even getting some of the, the tools we should use if it's MailChimp or HubSpot or whatever. How does that sound? That sounds great. I I mean, I just love this topic. Um, I, I get a little bit nerdy about it at times, so I'll, I'll try to do my best to steer through that. But um, yeah, you know, LinkedIn is a really, really interesting space because there's no more target rich environment for the B2B. Like if you're in the B2B space, like you have to uh, connect and, and nurture those connections, uh, you know, build your network that way. And at the same time, there's a lot of folks that are, I mean, I think you expressed this, but they're, they're approaching in a really unattractive way. Uh, and, and it sort of reeks of desperation. It's very salesy. And um, our program that we that we deliver is all about creating conversations. We actually call it conversations at scale, but uh, LinkedIn is one of the tools. It's not just a LinkedIn program, uh, and it's not just an email program. We, we go into email, and we love that space. In fact, my background is there. I've been doing it for a dozen years. I've had clients where we, you know, we grew their email list to 275,000 subscribers. We sent at one point, we sent two emails that produced a million and a half dollars for them. So we've had some big wins uh, just on email alone. And, and ultimately, email is the, I think it's the key to future-proofing your career and your business, right? Because you, you own that. Unlike the other social media platforms, we're seeing a lot of like, tight, uh, you know, huge uh, titanic size changes like on Facebook, for example, right now, where there are a lot of marketers that are, uh, flooding over to LinkedIn. That's one of the reasons why we have this problem of people being salesy. They're taking tactics that work for them on Facebook and they're trying to apply them on LinkedIn. And, and uh, it's, not a, it's not a great response that they're getting back from folks. 
And, so, um, and before we dive yeah. into the into into the content for this episode, I did want to upfront make sure I ask um, for anybody who likes what you're saying today. What what's the best place to find you online? You know, your, your website or Twitter or or whatever contact info you want to give. Mm-hmm. Uh, well, I appreciate that. Um, my website and actually all my social media profiles are just built around my name. So uh, t- it's Tobin, T-O-B-I-N, and then last name is Slavin, S as in Sam, L-A-V as Victor, E. That's the one that people, it sounds like an I, but it's an E-N dot com. So TobinSlavin.com and, uh, or any of the social media pla- uh, platforms, you'll find me at, you know, slash Tobin Slavin. Great. And uh, your podcast, again, is Stop Marketing Now, Do This Instead, which is nice. nice. Yeah, we, we have fun with that because <laughs> we always get that hook in there, which is, you know, people say, well, what is the this? And we leave them with a little bit of a cliffhanger. But for your audience, I'll tell you, it's, it's uh, you know, here's, here's where I came at this, uh, Will, is that I used to lay in bed at night and wonder where my next client was going to come from. Where's my next project? You know, when you're, when you are an independent and you, your business depends on what you go out there and produce on a day or a weekly or monthly basis, you're always looking forward. And, and, uh, you know, I was getting referrals from folks. That's, that's sort of a sign that you're doing good work and that people appreciate it and they're willing to refer, but it's inconsistent. You know, you can't count on those and the paid traffic approach probably works in some cases, but there's a lot of downsides to that as well. Um, so I just kept, I had this one thought in my head that we just kept coming back to, which is if I could create more conversations, you know, you think about like a convention arena where you're just talking with a lot of people. And if the conversations were with the right people, I knew good things were going to happen. So that's what we created. Um, so the LinkedIn comes into that, but it's not, not just about that platform. And in the email, you know, we, we very much love that space. In fact, I'll tell you a little bit about sort of our secret sauce in that space and why it works and, and why folks uh, should tap into that as well. Great. And, um, you know, I, I don't know if you'd agree, but it feels to me, having listened to more than a dozen episodes of your show, uh, you really kind of have um, kind of follow the philosophy of Seth Godin and permission marketing and getting people's permission to be in their inbox and providing value first before you ask and try to sell something. So it's really about, um, I, re- I really like that kind of philosophy. Let, let's talk a little bit. So, so let's say an independent professional, maybe they're a former you know, McKinsey consultant who was doing marketing and worked at Coach and then now they're independent, or maybe it's a supply chain person who was at AT Kearney and is now independent, or you know, uh, someone from another top firm who's now an independent professional. Let's say that they're thinking, oh, maybe I should have an email list. Give us a masterclass. Uh, who should they be, you know, inviting to it? What kind of content should it be? How often should they send it out? And what technology is a practical way do they actually need to use to get started? Mm -hmm. So there's two things I would tell you. So the first one is um, everyone should have this asset in their life because your background experience, your skill set that you bring to the table is constantly changing, particularly in the world that we live in now, because you know, there's so many uh, different technologies that are being disrupted and all. So that is constantly changing. Your network is constantly evolving as well. But when you, when you have a list, no one wants to be on a list, but when you think of it like your network or your warm, a circle of people that you can reach out to, that is the most valuable asset because while all the other things are changing around you, those relationships can be solid. It can be foundational. And uh, they can be life-saving in some cases. And if we get a chance, I'll give you an example of what I mean by that. But uh, um, it, it literally is, again, future-proofing your career and your business by having access. And the second thing is the biggest reason why people don't have a list yet is because they think they have to have a list to start. They don't, they don't realize that every, like all these folks that you hear about that have you know, 60,000 or 100,000 or 500,000 people on their list that they're able to uh, broadcast to and share messages to, and it gives them this enormous influence and impact in the market space. Um, all of those lists started with one person or, to, you know, the first five or 10 people. So what we've been seeing and what's super interesting to me is these tiny lists that, that just create monstrous opportunities and profit for people. Honestly, they might have a list of, you know, 500 people, but the 
the uh, production of that list, what they're able to generate of new opportunities from that list far exceeds people that have lists that are, you know, tens of thousands of times bigger. Yeah. You just need the right 500 people or, you know, the sort of the classic uh, meme is a thousand true fans, which anyone can Google and get the Kevin Kelly essay. Um, yeah, that, that's very much in, in sync. And there's a, there's a great uh, resource, uh, actually a newsletter writer that I tune into. He's a, a blogger and newsletter. Uh, his name is Josh Spector, but he has a definition of your audience. And he basically says people have it, they have it backwards. They're looking at the size of their audience and what they've done for you in the past, like how many people opened your last email or, or something like that. But the best measure is actually what is the size of the group of people that you can reach out to on your next project and they're actually going to be receptive. They're going to, they're going to open that message. They're going to, you know, they're looking forward to hearing from you because you built a relationship there. Cool. So how does someone get started? So let's say someone, you know, they probably have 500 LinkedIn contacts or something, and maybe they have a bunch of other emails. So let's say someone doesn't have an email list and they say, all right, I listened to the Tobin Slavin on the show. I'm going to do this. So what would be the first step to getting their stuff together? Mm -hmm. So the first thing, going back to your point about permission-based marketing is, you know, please do not go to your LinkedIn account because when you are connected with folks, you are able to see their contact information. Uh, a really, you know, bad process or honestly smarmy process would be to just scrape those emails off and start, you know, uh, putting those folks on your list and treating them as though they've opted in for those kind of messages. I don't like to receive those. I'm sure you don't either. And no, no one does. Uh, Permission-based marketing works on two levels. The first one is just, you know, someone making that choice themselves to say, yes, I'm open to receiving additional messages from you. And uh, so it's really important to follow. That's, that's you know, both by, by law and regulation, but also, you know, best practices. You don't want a list of people who don't want to be there because they're not going to produce the results that you're looking for. Um, so the strategies that take you from, you know, your first 25 or your first 500, uh, subscribers will be a little bit different from what you'll do when you get to a thousand or when you want to grow to 5,000 subscribers. Um, I'll give you a couple of examples. So, uh, at the first, at the most basic level, you want to think about what is the thing that the group of people that I'm interacting with, what would they find valuable? So, uh, the way I've done this myself, if folks want to see an example, um, on my website, you know, again, TobinSlavin.com, we have two one-page uh, sheets, you know, like a cheat sheet or, or a useful resource. Uh, one is called Five Simple Tips to Skyrocket the Value of Your List. Um, the second one is actually called uh, uh, The Five LinkedIn Pitfalls that You Have to Avoid if You Want to Get Clients from LinkedIn. Now, Neither of these require an opt-in. So the traditional marketer's playbook, what people have been doing for dozens of years now, is you have to stick your email in uh, to get people to, you know, opt into that list to get, to get these downloads. I'm actually not doing that. I just put them on my website. People can, you know, click a button and they can download it. The, the one pages are just in my Dropbox and I give them the direct link. Why am I doing that? Because I care more about building that relationship with folks. If I provide, like, I really believe in the value on both of these, uh, you know, downloads, like the, I put really good information and it's not, it's a one page sheet, but it's sort of a summary. They all have, they both have links to podcast episodes where I, we take a deeper dive and all. So I'm building the relationship first and trusting that if I give value with folks, uh, they're going to come back for more in a way that makes sense to them. So um, that's, that's the kind of thing I would think about to get your list started is think about who those folks are. What is something that you can put in front of them to start to build that relationship so they eagerly come back and they eagerly look for your next message because you've already provided value and they're looking forward to what's coming next. Cool. So let's say we start by saying, okay, we're not going to just spam everybody in our LinkedIn you know, network, but let's say we... Um, uh, you know, identify people that we actually have a relationship already with, right? The clients that we've served that we know, um, you know, colleagues maybe at our former firms. Uh, so we put together a list of people that we think, hey, if they got an email from me, even if it's a kind of a MailChimp, you know, email, 
they'd be they'd be cool with it. They'd be interested. So maybe the first step is we do that and we get their you know their first name, their last name, and their their email address, and we've we've created that you know, that list in Excel, let's say. So we've started, we've done that step. What would be practically like the next things to, to get started on, 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 on this, you know, in terms of, you know, either, um, like either you can just set it up technically like MailChimp or HubSpot or other programs. Do you have kind of recommendations mm-hmm. there on, on how you kind of, for someone, you know, kind of unsophisticated like me, you know, who's used to email, but hasn't used one of these platforms, like what, what would you, you know, how do you get started on doing the, the list part? Yeah, so I actually have three, uh, this is like uh, right in my, <laughs> this, is, this is in my uh, sweet spot of talking about email service providers because I've used all of them either for myself or for clients. And I'm going to give you three examples um, that fit three different situations that people may be interested in. But I'd like to I'd like to go back to one thing before we dive into the tools and the technology, just for a second. Sure. Um, th- this idea of connecting with folks and putting value in front of them. So um, I gave the example of using, you know, I put these these two one pagers on my website just to put them out there for folks. Um, when you are on LinkedIn or you're in a real life networking event, there's also this conversation that's going on that you're that you're having with folks, and you you have to again, invite folks in and sort of give them a preview. Like no one wants to join your newsletter. And if you frame it that way, I mean, I don't know about you, but there's no, like, why? I've already got enough email. I don't need more of that in my inbox. And most most folks don't. But if you're conversing with folks, so an example of this would be, so I deliver a weekly curated newsletter. Curated means that it's not just, uh, messages about me and from me and more me, 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 and, you know, my promotions. It's curated in that I took all the best stuff that I saw from the web in the past week and I put it in one email newsletter with, you know, again, sort of the same format as these one pages I was telling you about, but there's there's summaries with the links. And so I put this collection together. I call it like a basket of goodies. Like this is all the good stuff you don't have to go searching for. Like I do uh, weekly curation just as part of my business, put it in one place and I send it out once a week to my folks. So when I'm talking with folks, I'll usually say something to the effect of, you know, it was really great to meet you. And, um, you know, one of the best ways for us to stay in touch actually is if you want to take a look at this newsletter and I'll send them to a page on my website where they can see I've been doing this for a couple of years now. So literally they're just dozens and dozens of examples of what the quality of these baskets of goodies look like. Uh, so people can see whether it makes sense for them to, then they actually can choose to opt in. They put in their name and email and they will get that every week from me. And it's a great way for us to sort of stay in touch. You know, social media very much imposes on our life, but when it comes into our inbox, we can make, we get to make those choices. Is now a good time to read that message? Do I want to snooze it for later? Do I want to just, archive that one this week because things are really busy, but I don't want to forget about that person. They're going to show up in my inbox next week as well, but you've got to have value there. Just, just saying you're going to deliver a newsletter. No one needs more of that in their life. So that was what I wanted to share with you. You asked specifically about tools. Yeah, but Nail actually, is a, well, let me respond yeah. to that. Cause so number one, put me on your list, Tobin, or I'll go sign up. <laughs> okay. And then number two is, I think that's a really important point that you raise, which is um, a lot of us think newsletter, oh my God, I have to, you know, create all this really amazing content. Part of your strategy could be not, not necessarily creating all of it, but, but the curation part. So, and if weekly is overwhelming once a month or, you know, on some periodic basis of, Hey, if you're a supply chain person, like, Hey, there's this upcoming conference or this conference I went to it was fantastic. Or here's three white papers I read, or here's a book that I read, or here's a really good documentary or whatever. Here's a great YouTube video. So do that even that curation part um, can be valuable, you know, providing value. You don't have to, you know, create all the content yourself is a, is a good takeaway for me. Very much so. like there's a lot of work in creating content. So you, you remove that, you know, baggage of having to do all that work and you, you reveal a different side of you. So uh, in a curated newsletter, you may have work-related content, but you might also have, you know, other things that speak to your interests and your personality. So, for example, every once in a while, I'll throw in, you know, uh, 
a psychology story or because I have a background, I used to teach in the university in that space, or I might talk about Star Wars because I'm kind of nerdy every once in a while. So those things, that's how you build trust and authority with folks is over time, they get to know who you are. They get to see that you have a distinct voice. And curation is about becoming a tastemaker. Like we live in such a noisy, overwhelming world. No one needs more information. They need someone to make sense of that information. So you'll see on my newsletter when you get it that every link that is curated is not just the link. There's a little snippet that says Tobin's note. And I tell them what this is, why they should care about it, and what I thought of it, why I actually chose, why it made the list to be shared. Because I sift through you know, hundreds of things that don't make the list. I'm only sharing the best of the best. Fantastic. Okay. So um, back to back to platforms. So someone who hasn't done this before says, all right, I can do some curation. I'll write some of my own stuff too. Uh, uh, technically, like, what sort of platform should we do? We, we shouldn't just use our own email, sir, own, own email right? What, what, what should we set up? Mm-hmm. So the, the, the first place most folks go, uh, and this includes, you know, again, there's many email service providers. So there's there's big names like MailChimp and there's ConvertKit and Aweber and um, uh, Drip and Kartra and ActiveCampaign. I, I could, you know, go on and on with all the different, you know, HubSpot folks that have platforms that do this. But a lot of people go to MailChimp first because it's the biggest, uh, most active um, brand in the small to medium-sized business space. Uh, they allow you to have up to uh, to start with a free account, uh, free account, and have up to 2,000 subscribers. So people really love that. So you can start doing this. You can start sending out your your newsletter or your updates or whatever you're doing with it, you know, for free initially using their platform. And you only have to start paying when you want some of the premium features. So that's that's a big plus right there that you can just get a pro- professional uh, level platform because there's some big organizations that are also using Mailchimp. Uh, they continue to use MailChimp because it's, it's got a lot of advantages. A second platform that's it's actually owned by MailChimp, they bought it a few years ago, but it's very it's specifically good in the newsletter space, and that's called tinyletter.com. And here's why someone might want to look at Tiny Letter. By the way, it's also free, and we, we love free tools because it sort of allows people to get up and running. A Tiny Letter allows you to have a sign up page, you know, if, let's say for example, you don't have a website or you're doing this for your own personal brand, you have a, you can have a, a page to subscribe. It will archive your past uh, messages that you send out. And so it's got all those tools sort of baked into one place. And all you have to do is just write the, the message that you're sending out. So MailChimp, you know, those newsletters or, or messages might be a little bit more designed with, you know, uh, color and, and headlines and sort of look like what we expect a web page to look like. Tiny letter is more likely going to look like a text email. So it's a, a little bit simpler approach, but it's very effective to start to build you. A lot of folks have started their, their newsletters and their um, lists on that kind of small, simple platform. And then they grow into something else, you know, the additional functionality when they need it. All right, cool. So let's say, Someone says, all right, you know, I'm just going to go with the choice of the crowd. So MailChimp sounds like a good, good place to start. Um, if you want uh, to create your, uh, your, your template of what you're going to use to send out, um, do you recommend just going with one of the pre, you know, out of the box ones that they have? Or, or can you get a, a fr- you know, freelancer, someone off of Upwork to help kind of custom design it and add in your logo and your color scheme and to tell us a little bit about just that practical part of, of getting that part done. Yeah, so I'm, I'm actually going to give you some advice. It's going to seem a little bit contrarian. This one might surprise you from what, what you expected by how you phrased the question. So uh, there are, just so folks know, uh, on any of these platforms like MailChimp, there will be templates where you can fill in your information. I'm actually not going to advise that you do that. Um, we use, uh, because we do this for our clients, you know, our, ours is a done for you service. So we produce a weekly curated newsletter for our clients each week. So they don't have to touch it. Right. Uh, we use a platform called publicate and we use publicate because it allows us to make these really gorgeous sort of magazine style newsletters. Um, and they look really good and they're very, it's a very effective platform for curation. So that's, we, we create the newsletter there. We don't send through Publicate. We just cre- use it as the 
sort of design space, and then we take that code and we send it on whatever email service provider our clients are using. Um, so that's our process internally. That's maybe um, overbuilt for what a lot of beer folks might need to get started. But I actually would recommend, so this is the contrarian advice, when you send a message out to folks, and we've all experienced this, you know, uh, for example, in Gmail, there are different tabs, right? The yeah. email service providers are looking at a couple things. So here's an email that just showed up, and it has graphics. It has a graphic banner at the top. Um, it's coming from a IP address that is not Gmail, but it's actually, you know, the name is right, but it's coming from this other uh, IP address that we know is associated with an email service provider. Um, I see headlines and I see buttons and colors in this. Most likely that email is going to end up in the promotions tab or maybe even in the spam folder. That's our email um uh, platforms that we all use, whether it's Gmail or Yahoo or whatever you've chosen, Outlook would be another example. They're, they've all been engineered just try to cut out that clutter. So what we're actually doing for our clients is we're uh, utilizing, there, there are, there's a class of software out there that will work and plug into your email, um, like your Gmail account, or if you use Google Apps, it would plug into that. And there's a distinct advantage to this in that you can send one-off messages to folks. Okay. This is a really important distinction. There are two things that we're talking about, a broadcast of one to many, and we're talking about one-off messages. Okay. If you have to get an email to someone and it's important. So if you, for example, want to say, are you still interested in whatever your industry or topic is, the, the value that you're delivering? If you want to reactivate someone you haven't talked to in the last six or nine months, are you still interested in this thing? You want that kind of message to go out through your Gmail because your likelihood of getting um, of that message being opened and received and, and responded to is dramatically higher, much, much higher. Okay. Uh, in fact, I have a campaign right now that's getting 84% open rates uh, and 26% click-through rates, and we've, this campaign has been running over 90 days now. So it's not high volume. If you need to send a message out to dozens or thousands of uh, people, then you're going to need to use your email service provider. That's more of that broadcast. That's the kind of message that has a link at the bottom that says if you want to unsubscribe. You don't unsubscribe from a, from a Gmail message, right? You just message, you reply to that person and say, you know, please don't email me anymore. I just want people to understand there's two different things going on here. And then the second thing to know about that is when you do send, when you create a curated uh, newsletter. So for example, I'll send a message out text only the same kind of email that you'd send to a friend. I, you know, I just check in with my folks on a weekly basis. And again, it's sort of getting through some of these filters that uh, Gmail or any of the Yahoo or whatever have set up. It's a text only message where I'm writing to a friend. Uh, Will, you would open this, and there would be only one link in this message. And it would say, hey, Will, just letting you know this week's newsletter is ready. And when they click on that link, it will go to a web version. I'm not putting my whole newsletter into the email because it's not the best experience for the person who's receiving it. If they want to read that newsletter, it's right there for them, but we're not forcing it on anyone. Interesting. So rather than sending out the uh, the newsletter as this rich HTML, you're sending a just simple like text one liner saying, Hey, the weekly email is ready. Here's the link to click on to get it. Correct. Yeah. And, and, and I will, let me caveat this by saying I do have clients that, that still prefer the rich email newsletter experience. And we send that for them. That's an option for us, but we're finding a better response. And truthfully, we are moving to a world where folks are using Facebook messenger. They're texting they're, the message format that short, uh, very short snippets of conversation back and forth. That is how people are communicating now. So we've modified our email approach to really fit and work well in that world and get best results. Hmm. Okay. Yeah. Counterintuitive. Contrarian, like, like you promised. Um, okay. So we talked a bit about the tools and publicate sounds pretty interesting. I guess that you can use that with, with any of these providers. So let's say someone says, all right, I'm going to start kind of simple. I'll do MailChimp and, or maybe even the, the tiny letter. Um, how frequently should people be sending it? If it's, 
you know, if it's someone who maybe just wants to stay top of mind to a hundred former clients or 200 former clients and colleagues, you know, something on that order. We're not like building a list necessarily yet with, you know, uh, people that we haven't actually met in person in real life, but we're trying to just stay top of mind to our core network of people who know us. Like how often would you recommend we send something out and what are some ideas of things that you've seen successful people in that situation of the, what you actually send? Mm -hmm. So we actually advocate, again, this, you may not expect this, but we advocate sending weekly. And, and the reason why we do that is numerical. So you can do the math yourself, but if you take, you know, take a round number like a thousand or 10,000, just to make the math easy for, you know, to start, but whatever your number is, if you start uh, applying the average uh, industry open rates, which is like only 10 to 20%. So only one or two out of 10 people are actually going to open and see those messages. If you only send once a month, you know, when you start doing this math and projecting out the total number of opens, it's like only touching base with your, the people that you care about and that you want to groom those relationships. They're only hearing from you a couple times a year. So we're doing two, di two things differently. We're sending weekly. Um, people, I can, I can, I can hear the screams through the phone. People are saying, I, you know, I'm busy enough. I don't have time for this in my life to do this. But here's the thing. If you share, if you're already finding that you're sharing stuff with your friends, your family, you know, I, I, I started doing this. I would find a really cool article or something that I wanted to share with my wife. And so I just started putting all those curated links in one place. So I take, you know, a couple hours each week, put this all together and I have this newsletter ready to send out. So I was essentially doing the work anyways. I just had to organize it differently. We send it once a week. And then the other thing you see with this curated approach, because there's actual value there, and not a me, me, me kind of message, the open rates are two to three percent of two to three times higher, excuse me, not percent, times higher. And they're one to two times higher on the click through rate. So much bigger response. So Instead of, you know, a 10% open rate, you're getting a 30% open rate. You know, uh, we've seen open rates as high as 70% on these curated newsletters because you're training people week after week to, you're just top of mind in their inbox. It doesn't have to be fancy. It doesn't have to be salesy or promotional. You're just touching base and you're bringing value to them on a regular basis. And so one, one approach is, you know, curating, here's some stuff. And I, and I, and if you're, for somebody who's kind of focused in on an industry niche or a functional area, presumably some of that content would be, you know, curated around that. Like if you're into, you know, oncology, you know, research and development or, you know, um, you know supply chain with, you know, with Asia, then, you know, I suppose you'd say, you know, here's some of the latest industry news around this. Um, uh, beyond curating, um, what, what, what's your thoughts about creating content and what sorts of things have worked for your clients on that? Mm -hmm. So the, the approach that you just described, we call it the market watch approach. So uh, all of your audience, every single one of us actually have, we have access to certain information that other people could benefit from. So that market watch approach is, it's always a good way to lead if that, you know, see what's a particular, if you have industry reports and things, you know, and you can summarize and, and sort of help people understand what's important. That's always a great approach. For the other, the other things that you could include, we talk about news that you can use. So it could be a how-to video. Um, it could be an explanation. I just shared on LinkedIn a, a post this morning about blockchain because there's so much discussion around that. And there are a lot of folks who want to understand that space better because they can see it coming in a big way, but they don't really understand the nuances. So I actually shared a link to a podcast uh, actually called, you know, uh, Chain Unlinked, I, I think is the, the name of the podcast, but that was their, they're really digging deep into that space. So if folks are interested, you know, that's news that you can use for anyone that wants to tap into that kind of resource. And then the last thing, you know, strategically, you can place your, your offers, your promotions, your call to actions, the thing that actually make your business go, we're not ignoring that. We're actually making those more effect, uh, effective because when we do place them in the newsletter, we're strategic. For example, your curated 
um, information might have small thumbnail images to catch people's eye. But when you share that one link, uh, for example, Will, with your podcast, you could give your podcast center stage and have a big graphic and give it a full space. You'll see some examples of this in, in my newsletter, but uh, you can give it a different look and feel and it really creates a stage for your content and your platform. And at the same time, it's bringing great value to your audience. So you mentioned uh, you kind of you have a name for the market watch kind of concept, and then there's the news you can use. Are there sort of other categories? Is there you know four or five categories that those are two of? Um, yeah. So interesting. So uh, another one we talked about was the the how to approach. We we talked about people's own promotions, and then um, something that often gets overlooked by folks, but there are actually eight other ways to monetize. So when you start building an audience, most of us think about, you know, the product or service that, that we are actively involved with. Maybe we sell it or we deliver it. Um, there's other, when you start building an audience, you can monetize that audience in ways that not only benefit you, but ways that they will thank you for. You introduce them to things that they want and they're needing because you really are paying attention to what those folks need in their life. So Examples of these um, sometimes, uh, you know, uh, strategic partnerships. So you introduce them to a partner who, and there's an agreement on a referral fee. And so you're introducing folks to something they don't know about, but they need in their space. You have insider information on that, you know, to let them know why this is valuable to them. And that becomes a, an extra stream of revenue for you. So I'm, I'm actually going to give you uh, and your listeners one of the I think this is probably one of the most effective things that we do. We've, we've found that there's this approach that you can take. It's, it's really the call it the hand raising uh, offer or message um, that you share with folks. And that is that you, you things start to feel salesy and promotional when you, when you hit the audience with the same message over and over again, because you're trying to get through to, you're trying to get a response from them. And this is honestly, it's the mistake that most email marketers are making. Uh, they're just hammering their audiences. Um, and no one, you know, no one wants to receive those kind of messages, but if you put together in a very conversational way, um, are you still interested in? And so this, um, this approach was made, famous by a gentleman by the name of Dean Jackson. He has this thing called the nine word email. I think he first uh, sort of uncovered this approach uh, talking to folks about in the real estate space. So uh, he was working with realtors who were trying to reactivate uh, leads that they had had, dead leads, you know, folks who had not engaged with them in months and months. And they would send out a message and just say, you know, are you still interested in buying a house in, and they would name the neighborhood in Georgetown, for example. And what they found by being very short and conversational, there was no promotional language, no, you know, sort of adjectives or fancy, you know, 25 cent words in there. Just the way we would talk to friends, they were getting a, an enormous response from people who were replying and saying, yeah, actually, uh, we just started looking again. Or, um, no, we bought ourselves, but we have a friend that's looking right now. And it, it just created this surge of response. But more importantly, once those folks have raised their hand, you know where to focus in and you can go deeper, which means additional messaging just with the folks who have asked for it, not with your whole list. So now you're not burning. See, when we work with a list, it's not only, only about building the list. It's about bonding with that list. And you do that by making uh, deposits. Think about this like a bank account. Every time you give value, you're making a deposit with those folks. Every time you ask for something from them, you're making a withdrawal. And most email marketers are trying to withdraw on an account that has a zero balance. They haven't made any deposits. But if you do this consistently and you give value and you're sharing useful information and people see you as a trusted authority in your space, every, every week you're making deposits. And then when you do put a call to action out there in front of them in a very conversational way, people will respond and you can make a withdrawal that it's going to benefit you and your audience the folks who respond. Fantastic. Tobin, I, I wanted to ask you something that I ask a lot of guests, a little change of pace here. Um, in your own personal practice, do you have any kind of daily or weekly routines that you have um, either recently adopted or had for a long time that, that you find have, have really helped with your uh, you know, being effective? Yeah, so uh, 
funny you should ask that. So I ran into a, a stint this summer. Uh, my family was traveling uh, and I stayed behind to work. We, we were in a busy stretch in the business. And I started grabbing a uh, legal size sheet of paper and I, I would create a, uh, like a timeline for my day. You know, a uh, legal side is really wide, not tall, but a very wide. So it looked like a timeline format. And I started spacing out all the things I had to get done during the day, plus, you know, my personal fitness and things like that. And I've since created that when I first just started making my notes uh, on these blank sheets of paper, I now have a, um, uh, I call it my a scorebook. So I'm, uh, my background is in actually in athletics. So before I was in the business world, I used to coach first high school and then college basketball. And so I was used to this idea of having a scorebook for the games, and I've created a scorebook for my day. And my goal at the end of the day is to just win the day. Like every task I complete, you can think of it like, you know, making a shot or grabbing a rebound or, you know, how I, I'm just having fun with my day because Honestly, if, when I don't do this, the, the days just beat me down. There's so much to get done. And, and so I did two things that, that turned my day into a game. And one of the reasons why I love the digital marketing space, too, is anytime you have a scoreboard, if you can create time and score, you've created a game. And when you're playing a game, you're having fun again, like kids. And I think we, we, we lose that a little bit, and I miss that. Uh, but if you re-inject it into the business world and, and you know, Email marketing is a great space. LinkedIn is very gamified. You get to see how many, you know, we're producing 500 to 1,000 new connections uh, every month for our clients with the, the program that we do. So that's fun. Like, uh, I guess I, I'm just a nerd, but seeing those connections come in every single day, and these are like qualified, like really great connections for folks, not just, you know, random people. So that that's just, it's a game. And I started tracking it you know, first on paper, and now we've sort of engaged on the digital end, and uh, it's just fun. <laughs> I want I want to play games. I'm a kid at heart. The timeline for the day. I love it. I love it. I, I started doing something like that a few years ago, and it's it's just, it also kind of just relieves so much stress for me, right? Kind of getting it all on paper, and then I don't have seven things swirling around in my mind. Oh, did I forget something? What did I forget? Just put it on my sheet of paper, and... And then I'm like, okay, I can, I don't have to worry about it. Focus on one thing at a time. Um, that's great. Uh, any books that you really have often gifted or just have um, had a really big impact on you? Well, that's a great question. So I work with uh, a lot of folks in the coaching and consulting space. So um, I've actually been working at um, Elaine Pofeld, uh actually has a book called The Million Dollar One Person Business. And um, I bought that and I've shared that with a bunch of folks because um, you know, honestly, that's my avatar. That, that is the group of folks that I'm working with because they tend to be uh, either a solopreneur or maybe they have a small team or agency, but they, they would hire someone like us to come in and do a very specific, they want the outcome and the results that we can provide without expanding their in-house team. Um, and so it's just amazing. I think that these folks are flying under the radar and when you read Elaine's book. I mean, there are 35,000 people. This is based on um, uh, U.S. tax information. Uh, there are 35,000 of these businesses, non-employer businesses. So they, they only employ the principals, essentially, uh, that are making a million dollars or more. And then when you go down to the like 500,000 to uh, a million range, you know, that number is, I think, 250,000 or in that magnitude. And you go down to from 250,000 to half a million, there's another 500,000. So there's this just big cohort of businesses that are flying under the radar uh, and way more opportunity out there than, than most folks uh, realize. So that was an eye opener for me. And I've, I've talked a lot about that with uh, other folks that I thought would benefit. Fantastic. And folks by now may have gotten a sense of it from the discussion, but we sort of flipped, you know, a standard interview would start with tell me a little, your bio and tell me a little bit about your practice. So we kind of flipped it here, but, but as we close, you, let, let's do that. Give you know, so you're a basketball coach. Tell us a little bit about your business and what are the services you provide? Yeah. So we've, we've, uh, I've been working in the digital marketing space for a dozen years. Again, I, you know, I talked about, you know, some of our wins on the list building side. Um, we've run giveaways like in the B2C space, you can do these viral giveaways that are really fun to 
sort of construct and do list building around. Um, but right now we are focused really on just this one program that we call Conversations at Scale. And we're focused there because, one, I love the work. It's, it's fun. And, and two, it's the most effective thing um, that we've been doing. Like, there's no better, uh, this is kind of a marketing speak, but target-rich environment on LinkedIn. I have never been able to, uh, I'm, I'm located in Maine, so I'm not in New York City. I'm not in a, you know, a, a big business hub. But my ability to connect with folks like you will, honestly, folks doing really interesting work, that I might never have met otherwise, but to be able to have this kind of conversation and to, and to do that at scale so that every single day I see new conversations showing up on my calendar. Um, I don't go into them just trying to sell them something. I really genuinely think if you build real relationships and in a, a, a lively network of folks around you, good things are going to happen. And so I'm just thrilled to be able to do that for myself. And then, you know, we, we do, our program works two ways. We either have a done for you service where we're actually in the profile for our clients and doing this. I have a team of BAs and I do the strategy and they do the day-to-day -day work. Uh, or alternatively, we have some folks that have their own VAs or they want to do the work hands-on. And so we coach them, we give them our playbook uh, so that they have a really good framework to get the best results. Awesome. Well, you're fond of knowledge. I can personally recommend it to my listeners your your podcast because I've experienced, like I said, plenty of episodes. Uh, stop marketing now, do this instead. And the question is, okay, what's instead? So I guess you got to listen to the podcast to find out. And um, I'm going to explore more on your website. It sounds like there's a lot of great resources there. So Tobin, this has been really educational, um, fun talking with you. And thanks so much for joining. No, I, I very much appreciate you well giving me the opportunity. You can see I, I get excited and maybe even a little bit nerdy about the topic, but uh, uh, more than that, just you know, being able to connect with folks that are getting great information out there and uh, just appreciate you and what you're all about. Thanks for listening to this episode of Unleashed, the show that explores how to thrive as an independent professional. Unleashed is sponsored by Umbrex, the world's first global community of top-tier independent management consultants. The mission of Umbrex is to create opportunities for independent management consultants to meet, share lessons learned, and collaborate. I'd love to get your feedback and hear any questions that you'd like to see us answer on this show. You can email me at unleashed at umbrex.com. That's U-M-B-R-E-X.com. If you found anything on the show helpful, it would be a real gift if you would let a friend know about the show and take a minute to leave a review on iTunes, Google Play, or Stitcher. And if you subscribe, our show will get delivered to your device every Monday. Our audio engineer is Dave Nelson. Our theme song was composed by Gary Negbauer, and I'm your host, Will Bachman. Thanks for listening. <laughs>